Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining our uh, webinar today. Um, we appreciate everyone taking some time to, to to be with us, and especially those who were on our last one we held a couple of months ago. Welcome back. Hopefully, uh, obviously, we must have done something right last time for you guys to be with us again, which is very good to hear. Um, my name is Mark Mickelson with Journey Team. Um, I'm going to be just kind of kicking things off for us to go through this this uh, webinar today. Um, the plan is we want to give you guys a good update of of all the things that have have been rolling out with Microsoft over the last couple of months. So this is going to be a kind of rapid fire session. We're going to be going through a lot of content, um, enough to get you guys a good understanding of what's changed. Um, at the end of the session, at the end of this uh, webinar, we're going to have a, a, a survey sent out for you guys to be able to fill out. And if you have additional questions, please feel free to to send those over to us, and we'll be happy to get back to you and, and talk further on on some of the details we share with you today. Um, for those of you who don't know a lot about Journey Team that are on this call, um, Journey Team, we've been around for 25 years. Um, been doing this for a long time. We're a uh, um, uh, Microsoft Gold partner, managed partner. Um, we cover uh, also Okta. We do business technology consulting. Um, we're one of the top places to work in, in Utah. Um, and also we were just named a US Partner of the Year this last year. Um, so we cover a lot of the gamut of Microsoft technologies from Office 365, EMS, um, Dynamics 365, SharePoint, uh, both, uh, sorry, Dynamics 365 on the CRM and ERP side, as well as SharePoint and B business intelligence and, and uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence as well. So today for our sessions, we're gonna have uh, presenters. You should be seeing them on your screen. Um, that's uh, I'm Mark. Um, we'll be having uh, Eric Bynes, our CRM lead. Um, Eric Roff, our Cloud and Office 365 lead. George Sagan, our ERP lead. Preston um, Reynolds, who is our Power BI and Power Platform lead. Kip Sorensen is our SharePoint and Document Management lead. And so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and let, give it, pass this over to Eric Roff to kick off our, our first session. Um, as we're showing right now the agenda, um, he'll be leading us off with Cloud and Office 365, and then we'll be flowing right straight down through there, through Teams, SharePoint, Forms and Planner, Dynamics 365 Customer Engagement, Virtual Agent, Power BI and Business Analytics, Exchange Online, Dynamics 365 Business Central, Cybersecurity and Azure AD changes, and then Flow and Power Apps will be what we wrap up with. So we'll let uh, Eric Roff take us on, uh, go forward on Cloud and Office 365. Fantastic. Okay, glad to be with you all. Thanks for attending. Um, the first thing I wanna talk about is a couple of updates in Office 365. Um, the next slide I've got here is a screenshot of some functionality that I've been waiting for a long time. Um, this is the a change to the behavior with how Microsoft governs and enforces how many copies of Office you can have. So in short, when you have a subscription to Office 365, which includes the Office suite, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, etc. Historically, you could only have five copies, only have, yeah, this is so painful. You could only have five copies of Office installed per device type, okay? So if you wanted six Windows computers to put Office on, when you tried to activate Office on that sixth computer, it would tell you, sorry, you've exceeded your, your license count. You need to go and deactivate something. And users weren't sure where to do that and how to do that, et cetera. So what Microsoft is changing is when you try to activate one more than your uh, official five count that you have available, then what Microsoft will do is they will go in and find the oldest, um, least used copy of, of Office, and they will automatically deactivate that, that device allowing you to activate it on the new device. So they haven't changed the number of activations you can have concurrently. You can still have five per device type. And just to be clear, that's five for Windows, that's five for Mac, that's five for Android, that's five for iOS. That's a lot of devices. They are, but the nice thing is they're making it lots more uh, seamless and frictionless relative to adding that new device and um, the old ones will drop off from activation. 
So pretty quick little update. It's a nice little feature though, that's coming for the Office client installation, okay? So next feature I wanna talk about is a fantastic feature that I've been waiting for years with. Um, if you have Office 365, uh, by default, users can create Office 365 groups. There are many front doors for creating those groups. For example, you can go into Microsoft Teams and create a new team that ultimately builds a group under the covers. You can go to Planner, you can go to Power BI, you can go to Yammer, um, you can go to Outlook Web Access. You, and, and any of these doors, if you will, will ultimately create an Office 365 group. So group governance is a really big deal, okay? Um, I recently ran a PowerShell script. There's a note at the bottom there, hey, ask us about this slick PowerShell script that did this analysis of Office 365 groups and which ones are being used and active and who has owners and how big is the mailbox and if, are they using Teams and how many channels and all this good data around all your Office 365 groups. Okay, so ping us if you're interested in that. The new feature that is available now is this group expiration feature. It's been out for year plus, but the problem with it is that regardless of the quote activity of a group, the owners of a group would receive an email saying, hey, are you still using your group? And if so, you need to click this button so we don't delete it for you. And so some of the clients didn't like that because um, activity was not a consideration with the group expiration feature. This is changing. Um, so now there's nothing you have to do to enable this in your tenant. When Microsoft rolls it out a little further, it's in private preview right now. Um, I'm don't anticipating it being in private preview for a long, long time, but it is in private preview. I've got a client on that private preview that we'll be validating this with very shortly. But um, this will be great. So if your group is active, then you won't get the email that says, hey, are you still using your group? And you better click this button or we're gonna delete your group in 30 days or 15 days or one day prior, okay? So activity is going to be tracked by uh, a post to the team, an email sent to the group or a document being uploaded or read uh, from the SharePoint site. And Microsoft may continue to extend that, that requirement of what is quote activity mean, right? But this is a big deal. Okay, so if you want to do governance around your groups, I would recommend turning on group expiration if you're letting people create groups. Once again, by default, they are. And uh, this activation is a great feature that's coming coming shortly. Um, so that's what I've got. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Kip now. He's going to get into some of the Teams uh, options for you. And if you guys want to hear Roth and I just get really passionate, just talk to us about those 365 groups. This is such a thing that we could riff on for like a whole hour session in regards to how sprawl and management, all those things looks like. So anyhow, so let's get into Teams. First off, Microsoft is on a mission and that mission is to kill Slack. Uh, here's some latest data in regards to what Teams is looking like from an adoption perspective. This is 13 plus million daily active users currently on Teams. And through some of these updates, we'll actually get a really good idea in regards to how much momentum is is on the adoption of Teams, but also how many adjustments and fine tuning and new features that Microsoft is constantly pushing into this ecosystem. So much that it's almost a little overwhelming. And I'm gonna have to go through these really, really quick. Um, as Mark mentioned earlier in the, in, the, uh, in the presentation, reach out to us if you guys wanna deep dive into some of these subjects. We're always willing to talk shop with you guys and, and give you more information. So let's let's get into some highlighted specific fun items. So the first one would, would really be around the functionality of, of conversations. So we have the ability now to create announcements within the Microsoft Teams client where we can uh, format the actual heading of an area, embed some images, and then it's really just a, a, a more or less a conversation thread, but with formatting that's available to us. Um, the other functionality that's available to us as well is our ability to actually push announcements across the Teams ecosystem. So in this example here, we see that we're creating an announcement and then I'm able to select which channels in which this announcement will go to. So I can choose channels across multiple teams in which I have access to and then broadcast an announcement across that entire ecosystem. 
moving on with additional items. And these are, like I mentioned earlier, these are just kind of some highlighted items. There's so much more, but uh, we have limited time in which, in which we can talk about things. Another item is we can actually manage discovery of our private teams. So before we didn't have this functionality, but when a team is flagged as private versus public, we can make it so people have the ability to discover those private teams and then request to join, or we can ha have them hidden completely. So if your company is working on a merger and there's a teams about it, right? We want to keep those hidden so new employees accidentally run into that particular project and whatnot. So this is a really handy feature and, and one that we've actually had multiple clients request in the past. And unfortunately, I used to say, nope, there's nothing you can do about it. But now we can say, yes, there is. Moving on, here's some quick highlighted items around teams that I just want to pull out. So these are things that are coming. Some of them are rolling out as we speak. Other items um, are already rolled out and you may see them available within your tenants. Music on hold, share system audio within Teams. Teams chat groups, when you just generate an ad hoc group for chatting is up to 100. Priority notifications, file sharing within the Teams uh, app, information barriers that actually limit what users can have communication with other users within your organizations. Configurations around the waiting room, who has to wait in the waiting room? only in or people, trusted organizations, everybody, or even only external people outside your organization. And of course, the ability to create an org-wide team up to 5,000 users. Before you do that, talk to me because I have a strong opinion on whether you should or not. And I like to be heard and I like to hear myself talk. All right, SharePoint. So here's, here's some SharePoint updates. These ones are pretty fun things. And I have little zoom in links here. So enhance quick edits for lists and libraries. We have a filter pane that is now available when we're in quick edit mode. So you can see here that as I'm in quick edit, I get the filter panel down the left-hand side while I'm in edit mode. Before, those filters were only available when I was um, viewing the content. Once you went to edit, those filters actually went away. The next item uh, in this list is all formatting appears in the quick edit. So even though I've gotten into the quick edit, I keep those formattings in place. We get breadcrumbs. We can actually adjust the column width of our lists and actually save those column li lists. And then we have drag drop columns and an en enhanced people picker that's available to us as well. So in this quick little zoom in here, you can see that we can drag and drop the columns or rearrange. We can actually even insert columns in between columns and then the people picker is a lot prettier than, than just not seeing Eric Bynes face. You know, and now we get to see his image. All right, moving on. Here's some more SharePoint updates. All right, update, uh, updated site usage page, it's extensive. Uh, there is so much here, but really it's around visitors, unique visitors, traffic, what platforms, what's mostly being viewed within the site. This is just Microsoft uh, providing a much better site usage uh, report than they had in the past, it's, it's getting better. Uh, moving on, we then have uh, updates around uh, page news authoring improvements. We can drag and drop images onto an edited page and it'll automatically put that image into an image web part and place it on the page automatically for you. You don't have to actually browse to the image. There's link previews that are available. We have anchor tags that we can embed on pages. We have undo, redo, and then even vertical sections uh, that we can implement within uh, pages as well. Uh, there's also an improved footer that will do the navigation and whatnot. Now, this is cool. I put it on here. I don't know really, to be honest, with the business cases for this, but maybe there is one you guys can let us know. So there is now a built-in 360-degree image viewer. It's built in. It's not an extra web part. It's nothing. If you access an image that is tagged as a 360 degree image, the image viewer web part or page, if you want to call it that, will allow you to actually interact with it. You can also upload existing images and tag them as a dot. 360.jpg, and then you will be able to interact even with flat 2D images as well. Kind of fun stuff. Next, um, here's just my rapid fire of a bunch of other updates. Enable modern communication sites at the root tenant. This was a major problem in the past. A lot of our clients know we have a solution for this. Now Microsoft finally came around and joined us and made a solution that we can use. Um, email notifications is another item that we can enable um, and not enable. 
uh, in regards to if the site owner receives notifications of comments and replies and those kind of things. So that's an added benefit. Um, page news uh, recommendations is a new web part that will actually serve up suggested content to users. Yammer groups that are actually tied to a 365 group will now store their data within SharePoint just like Teams does. Hub sites, the events web part will now have roll up functionality from all of its associated parts. There's another web part um, for organizational assets within your organization. So a marketing department can actually have a centralized library for all organizational assets, and then employees can pull from that location. And then our web parts now have the capability to connect with one another, and we can edit navigation via uh, drag and drop to change the order. I'm almost done. I'm, I'm hurrying. If you guys want more details, obviously let me know. Uh, these are a couple more fun items. On the next slide here is the news web part that ships uh, out of the box um, with uh, already on modern sites, now has a hero view, now has a hero view. So that's a huge win for a lot of our clients. We can configure per site, anyone links. We can move sites around the ecosystem. We have modern documents, access to power apps on a custom form in SharePoint, you can do that without them having to have a Power Apps license, believe it or not. Um, and then Hero has a few uh, updates as well. And then this is the most important slide and the one that you guys all have been waiting for, and that is updates around Forms and Planner, because I know everyone's using Forms and Planner extensively. And that's a joke. Next slide. Um, but some of this is kind of cool stuff. So one, Forms Pro is live. Second, you can transfer ownership of Forms from one employee to the other. We can add quizzes and polls that interact with stream and forms. We now have branching within forms. Users have the ability to actually copy a plan and create future plans. And then you can actually take your plan or export to Excel. And finally, to do the to do app, you can now integrate and show your tasks that are assigned to you across all of the plans within the ecosystem and access them within the to do app. All right, that's all I got. I'll hand it over to Eric Bynes or the other Eric. Yeah, so Eric Bynes here. <laughs> We've got uh, a couple of updates that I wanted to go through for customer, in, in customer engagement. There are a number of other things we talked about last time that have continued to got, get improvements. Those are sales insight, market insights, and our uh, customer service insights. So if you haven't played around with those additions yet, uh, please go in and, and look at those. First thing I wanted to talk about though is you, you've probably noticed that there are system notifications and messages in uh, CRM right now telling you that uh, Flow is going to be taking over as, as the workflow engine. And so I wanted to give an example of, of that today of how you can now build your own custom relationship assistant cards. Uh, and then I'm um, also going to preview and, and show you guys some of the functionality of, of the newer product, the D365 for marketing. So in um, in your settings, if, if you've you know gone into the advanced settings in the new uh, unified interface, you'll notice in the process center that it's it makes available flow templates so you can navigate directly into flow. And uh, they are again pushing this very heavily. I would say, you know, probably in, in the next few releases, they'll have, uh, you know, replaced the uh, the old almost version 4.0 workflow editor. The overview is is that um, as an either administrator or a sales manager, based on your your permissions, uh, you have the ability to go in to your sales AI and configure and build your your own flows and uh, have those execute as um, as action cards. So how do you do that? Um, if, if you go in and uh, navigate now uh, into your new unified interface down at the bottom where you select the area that you're navigating to, if you go into app settings, sales intelligence system configuration, um, inside of the AI setup uh, on the assistant, if you hit configure, then that's where it'll actually launch you into the editor. What they've done is they've given you some good templates to work with. And um, then as you can see at the bottom of there, you can also go in and create a, a blank flow if you're familiar with this. But what it's really leveraging now is the common data service uh, being hooked up to Dynamics and other things. So in, in terms of being able to pull data from other sources and mesh that into a workflow, 
uh, that, that you may be uh, running and now in this example being able to create um, inside cards you can pull data uh, to help you remember to do things uh, across more than just traditionally your d365 records so here in this example and and you guys can reach out to us afterwards on this but i wanted to just highlight you've got three common data service steps here where it's going in and saying i need to pull data from here i need to pull data from here and pull data from here you take those three entities and then what it does is you go through and define your branching logic and in this case it was hey remind me that i need to you know follow up with somebody if if uh, they haven't um, had any activity with us so we're going to go ahead and be able to run through that and as you see in that splitter you've got a yes path and a no path so now you can even put you know that same type of logic that you would traditionally have built into a workflow now you can even put that in as the logic on your action card so if you guys haven't used action cards or set up the relationship assistant i strongly encourage it it dives into exchange it uses email engagement um, it, it knows if you had received an email from a client or a customer asking for an attachment and um, you didn't do anything about it, then they're going to go ahead and, and send you an action card. And now you have the ability to, to design and build those yourself. Okay, very cool stuff. Strongly encourage you guys go in and, and play around with that. Now, uh, switch, switching gears here, D365 for marketing. This is a fully integrated marketing platform that runs in D365 and leverages the data that already is there. So all of your lead, contact, account information um, is accessible. The other cool thing about this is that as the as they've worked on this, they've really improved the designer, and we'll we'll see that here in a minute. But so they've they've made a good graphical interface. It's a WYSIWYG editor, um, but they've also extended it so you can tap into LinkedIn, you can share information. Um, but one of the coolest things is that as you go through these journeys, the insights that you see, you can actually save data back and create segments based on the interactions of your customers in a journey. So an example would be, hey, save data. So everyone that clicks a link that I put in my marketing email, I want to create a new segment called people who clicked the link in my ABC marketing email. And the the system will automatically let you do that from within the journey. Other couple things that are really cool about this, they've, they've integrated voice of the customer or the survey mechanism. You can manage sites. You can embed either your own hosted information and, and track um, from D365 marketing, or you can use portals. So they've integrated um, CRM portals into the marketing functionality as well. Really quick, wanted to show you guys just a, a, an example of, of what the flow editor looks for campaign automation. In this example, you start with a segment or the group of people that you want to target. You can have uh, these, these different um, engagements. So you know, do you want to send them an email? Do you want to direct them to a page? Different um, interactions or event uh, calls, you can set triggers, you can set schedules. And then the other cool thing about this is that you're able to even kick off workflows in the customer journey. So as they do a certain action right from the customer journey, you can have other data then uh, get kicked off and updated inside of uh, D365. The other part, this is your email designer. Um, and if you want to use your own HTML, you can, but they've also created this WYSIWYG editor. D365 will allow you to host and manage all of your own assets. You can tag those. Um, you can use them on sites and emails. And so it, it will start to um, allow you to, to work with all that content. It handles all of your subscribing and unsubscribing or your subscription center. Uh, but it is a, is a pretty straightforward uh, WYSIWYG editor, and they have a number of pre-built templates that, uh, that you can use and work from. And then here, the ne next piece um, that, that I wanted to call out is the insights and the information that you get from this. Because it is an integrated platform, on a contact level, you're able to see how many emails they've they've received, how many times they've clicked them, how many times they've opened them, how many times they've forwarded them, how many websites of yours have they gone to, when did they go to them, you know, what did they click on there, 
Uh, you have the ability to manage events in D365. So you could see if they've registered and, and attended an event. So you can you know create segments and, and message them on that. The other part is that if you're in the customer journey, there are analytics and data about that. So you can see how many people entered that stage and then you can see the actions they performed as they went through each thing. So the example here is, hey, we sent this email out, you know, went to two people, one person clicked, one person didn't. So you kind of, you know, get the understanding and the assessment right there as you're looking at your journey. What are the analytics and the information behind it? That's what we've got um, in, in terms of some of the, the newer features. Um, obviously, there's there's a whole bunch of uh, information on, on this. Feel free to reach out to us and, and we'd be happy to dive into it further. Eric Roth, you're next, my friend. Fabulous. Okay, I thought... Uh... All right, here we go. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about a new feature of Exchange Online. So this has been a long awaited ask. Um, if you're using the Outlook mobile app, you will soon have the ability to open shared mailboxes and see them, send mail from them, uh, interact with them through the Outlook app. Okay, there's a, I've got a screenshot here of when you go add an account through the Outlook mobile app, you will see the ability to add a shared mailbox. Uh, today, you may see add email account and add storage account. The shared mailbox is coming very soon. Um, there is a couple of dependencies that you need to have here, so be aware of this. Number one, uh, you have to have access to the shared mailbox. Surprise, surprise. Um, so that has to be in place. Number two, you have to have the Microsoft Sync technology enabled in your tenant. For 99.99% .99 of you, that should all be done. Um, this is one feature that Microsoft rolled out to the government cloud first, and now it's in the uh, enterprise cloud. Um, you can validate that by looking at your current Outlook client and looking at your account, and down at the very bottom there, you'll see Microsoft Sync technology. This is the newest technology. Um, to have Outlook connect and synchronize to Exchange Online as well as Outlook.com. Um, and so if your tenant says Microsoft Sync Tech and you have access to a shared mailbox and you have the latest updates to the Outlook app, you will see the ability to add a shared mailbox. Okay, so um, last update I had from Microsoft was as of the end of June of this year, your tenant should have the Microsoft Sync technology in it, but never say always, and so double check that, okay? So that's what I had on Exchange updates. There, as, as Kip said, there's many, many more, but this is, a, this is a big ask that's been out there for a long, long time. So we will hand it off now over to George. Thanks, Eric. Uh, we're really excited on the Business Central team uh, to cover two general topics today. One of them is going to be the October release, and the second will be our uh, upgraded migration in the cloud technology. So starting with the October release, uh, this is uh, currently available to the partners, and we are uh, eagerly digging into the uh, new features and licking our chops over the cool stuff that they've come out with. Uh, we will actually be presenting a follow-up webinar, we think, here soon, where we where we go over many of these specific ones. But just addressing some of the ones we're excited about, uh, we now have three deployment methods for Business Central. Uh, classically, it's been in the cloud, with the on-premises be version being Navision and separately uh, uh, treated as a separate product. Now they are fully merged uh, functionality-wise. You can deploy Business Central in the cloud, on-prem, and they also have a hybrid uh, deployment that um, if you're interested in doing that, we can discuss. Moving right along, um, lots of productivity improvements. Uh, many people have been excited about the ability to um, copy entire rows in the list views, uh, improve the filtering features on the list, and even give subtotals now and totals on, on the list where it counts the number of records, fields, for example, that may be listing invoices, it'll, it'll total the invoice amount <laughs> column. And the, uh, they're yet improving, again, the uh, performance of the scrolling and navigation on those lists, and they've made the, the menus more intuitive. They're, they're cleaning up some of the redundancies that were out there. 
uh, several application improvements um, in the inventory settings, lots of different uh, inventory types other than pure inventory. There's a non-inventory type that can be used uh, with, that gets a lot of the features of inventory without you actually having to maintain physical counts. They've updated a lot of the layouts on, on the reports and um, several process automation improvements, particularly in the accounts payable payments area. Another feature people have been clamoring for is the permission sets that come built into the system are kind of canned, maybe a little too general use. Um, they made it much easier to take a standard permission set and then apply it to a user and then get in and, and tweak and personalize it for that, for that user. Now we have, uh, we found a trend where um, a lot of our customers are getting behind on their updates on their legacy uh, Dynamics uh, ERP systems. Um, Microsoft has a, a tool now called um, Intelligent Edge that allows you to take your GP or your uh, Navision or your SL deployment and publish a subset of that data out to the cloud, making that data, and it publishes it into an instance of Business Central. And then it makes those, uh, Business Central has a lot of services in the cloud that uh, you, you might find desirable to use on your legacy system, but you can't get at them because they're only deployed for Business Central in the cloud. Uh, the Intelligent Edge allows you to sync up a subset of your data from those other databases out to a Business Central instance in the cloud and then have access to stream analytics, machine learning, the common data service, Power BI, um, Flow, Power Apps, uh, lots of those other really cool tools. And now people are kind of getting a flavor for, hey, this is what my data would look like if it was in Business Central. And so many people are talking about upgrades. We are offering an upgrade in the cloud um, solution. And this is meant to help make it easier to catch up on your, on your upgrades. When you get several upgrades behind, it can be really time consuming and really expensive to take your, your legacy system, upgrade the OS, upgrade the, the database, then upgrade your application and do that one hop at a time for each of the versions that you need to go through. Um, we think that people are missing out on a lot of value uh, by not upgrading their systems. And uh, you can see the list here of all the different um, uh, reasons to upgrade. Uh, we've provided a cloud upgrade process to help streamline this. So we've created virtual machines with every version of the operating system and the database that's required to support each version going back to some of the very old versions up to the current version. We take a copy of your database, we stick it up in the cloud, and then we just start uh, upgrading it on that on a, on the virtual machine, move it to the next virtual machine, upgrade again, and we can do a complete uh, multi-version upgrade in, in just a couple of hours, usually turning those around in, in a single uh, workday. So we're really excited to offer this, this service. Um, basically, the, the, uh, the, the benefits of this, we can, the, because the images are pre-configured, it's a lot faster. Uh, we're doing over and over many of these uh, upgrades, and so it's a lot quicker, a lot more cost-effective. So we're actually able to offer an upgrade for much uh, cheaper doing it this method than if we were to just come on site and start upgrading your servers. And then in the end, you actually end up with, with an instance of your legacy system that if you wanted to, we could more easily redeploy it in the cloud on, in Azure. Another reason a lot of people are doing these is we've had a, a really big increase in the number of our customers who've had malware and especially ransomware attacks on their on-prem servers. And um, uh, people have been losing their entire uh, data sets to this. And by deploying in a safer cloud hosted solution, we feel that your, your data can be a lot safer. So on that note about security, let's uh, hand it back off to Eric Roth to talk about cybersecurity. Fabulous. Okay, so a couple of updates here around Azure AD and MFA. So the first one here, um, this is another long time coming that's uh, excited to see drop. Um, this is uh, one of the features that went public preview, excuse me, went private preview via Twitter. Um, never seen that before coming out of Microsoft that they announce a private preview for something via Twitter. Uh, I tried to get on that. I wasn't special enough anyway, but it only stayed in private preview for about a month and now it's hit public preview. And that is the long awaited physical hard token support for Azure's multi-factor authentication. These are FIDO2 uh, security keys, they call them. 
Uh, FIDO is a uh, acronym, FAST Identity Online is what it stands for. It's an alliance that helps define the standards for uh, multi-factor authentication to any device type. Um, lots of cool potential coming down this road with FIDO2 compliant devices. So the long story short is that you can now start enrolling a physical token. And when I say token, we're talking a USB device, a USB-C device, um, a NFC enabled FIDO2 token so that you can have uh, NFC support with your phone. You can get you touch your phone to this device and NFC will light up. So this is the a, a great use case and a great story for those clients that need multi-factor, which if you don't think you do, you're wrong. Everyone needs multi-factor. Um, it's a great use case for users that need multi-factor that the audience or the, the user base may not have access to a phone. Um, and that's been a big challenge historically for um, some of the workers that you may have that you, know, they, you don't provide company phones for them, they don't want to use their personal phone, that kind of thing. I've heard lots of those stories. So you can provide them a physical token. These tokens are relatively inexpensive. Um, you can get the cheaper stuff for 20-ish bucks, that's retail uh, per device, okay? So um, pretty slick. Uh, let us know if you are interested in this uh, before you just go turn it on. There's some other dependencies there that either are important to understand relative to the MFA enrollment experience. Uh, I mentioned this on our last call that Microsoft is converging the SSPR, self-service password reset, with the multi-factor authentication enrollment. And that's a, a requirement for this, as well as um, Microsoft has in public preview the GUI version of passwordless login. And if you turn that on, there's a bug right now where it affects your tenant level passwordless login. So long story short, reach out to us if you want to go down this road and we can help you with this. So that's, uh, that's what I've got on the Azure MFA hard token support coming up. Let's go next slide here. So another little Easter egg. Um, I was working with a client last week and this view came up when we were looking at their MFA options and then it went away the next day uh, did some digging around and figured out how to get to this url so if you're using the new converged sspr slash mfa enrollment experience um, then you can go to the url there at the top of the of the slide mysignins.microsoft.com slash recent dash activity and this is where an end user can go and see the login events for their identity um, and it shows you the geolocation of where that login came from, the operating system, the browser, um, the app that you were using, uh, et cetera. So this is a fantastic visibility for end users to see who's been logging into their account. Hopefully it's just them. Now, right? now we have your IP address too, Roth, right? Uh, that's where I live, sure. <laughs> <laughs> You can, uh, you can hack my house, you bet. Um, anyway, so a uh, fun little Easter egg. This, this will come public sometime in the future. I haven't heard any uh, notices of when that's going to come, but uh, great little visibility if you want to kind of keep an eye on where your logins are coming from in the cloud side. So I think that's what I had here. So let's go hand it over to, I believe, Preston or George, who's next on this. I'll take it. This is Preston. Preston's the man. All right, light us up. Thanks. So if you haven't heard of the Power Platform for Microsoft, it consists of three major tools that tie in really well with pretty much everything else Microsoft makes. Um, those three tools are Power Apps, P Microsoft Flow, and Power BI. I don't know why they didn't call it Power Flow, but they didn't. So um, we're going to start off by talking about Power BI and some of the updates that have come here. So first off, if um, you've got a global company and you're working with um, people in the South Africa or a African continent, now is the time you can create a um, tenant in the South Africa region and use it with your Power BI, um, use, use Power BI in that. Uh, a really cool long awaited feature is this new public preview for the new look of Power BI service. So let me just walk you through some of the big details here. Right at the top, number one, is um, 
you can now see right in a report when it was last refreshed. There are some clever ways that you could hack around this and show on a report how um, how recently a data set had refreshed, but now they just publish it right on the page for you, which is super handy, um, as well as who the owner is. You can click into it and contact them and um, what the title of the report is. So that's in the number one section. Number two, instead of having your navigation for a report along the bottom of the page, it's now moved to the left-hand side, a lot like it is in Word or in PowerPoint. Um, and you can resize that section and the whole report will um, very nicely resize with it. Um, and number three, we've got this simplified action bar at the top. So historically, all the buttons that you needed were along the top and you can see them in three different sections here, but they took the telemetry data to figure out which buttons were being clicked the most and they put those actions at the top so that people, as they log in, um, have those most frequently used actions easily available to them. Um, so if you're if you turn it on, turn on the new pre preview look here, um, and you're missing things, note that it's probably in the little dot 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 context menu just next to the favorite icon. Um, the new filters experience is awesome. It's a huge improvement over the uh, over the old filtering experience, and we're going to take a look at that more in depth in just a second. Um, and then we've also got some new colors and icons across the whole panel that really lay out well and tie in with the new updates to the Power BI desktop look and feel, which are a little bit lighter and cleaner overall. So um, here's a quick video on or demo of how to get into it. So right here at the top, you've got the new look. And as you click, you can drag and resize to get different parts of your pages shown. Here are all of the uh, actions that you could perform and how to get to them. And um, the new filters pane, which we're gonna talk about more, but it's that little slicer, or the little toggle at the top that says new look off. That will take you into the new look. All right, so here's a uh, deeper look into the new, oh, snap. We're gonna get back to that in a minute, it looks like. Okay, so service outage notifications. Previously when uh, Power BI went out, you didn't really have a way to identify that it was out other than, hey, is it out for you too? Asking your buddy across the desk. So you now have the ability to get notifications in the admin portal. Um, and under your tenant settings in the admin portal, you have, in order to get to this, you need to be a Power BI ad, um, admin. You need to have the role of Power BI admin in Office 365. So you come in here, tap, put in your uh, security group, and then they will all be emailed when there's an outage for Power BI, super helpful, but hopefully you never have to get an email like that. So um, Power BI, in fact, they have really fantastic downtime, like almost never happens, but there you go. Um, here's the new filter experience that is now generally available. So here we go. So the old filter experience had only in desktop mode, the ability to see what filters had been applied to a specific item on a report or visualization on a report. So they've updated that to show both in the service and in the desktop what filters are being applied on a page level, on a report level, or on a visualization level. And you can also now hover over a specific visualization and it will give you what the filters are or what filters are being applied there. Um, in this view, you can see in this report, if you just hover over the little filter icon, you can see the read-only view of all the filters that are applied right to that report visualization. So you don't have to wonder, okay, what's not showing up in this that makes it look like this? Um, one of the biggest complaints that people used to have was, I don't really know what makes this look so nice or what makes this data look so bad, but you can show your filters here and therefore see what's going on a little bit easier. Um, additionally, you can hide filters from report consumers. So if you didn't want that, um, to be shown to an end user, that might be something like hide blanks. Um, that might be a good reason to hide something from a user, but you can hide them from them and you can also lock filters so that people can't change those that are being applied to a report. All right, um, aggregations for petabyte scale BI is now available now in GA for Power BI. This is super cool. So if you've got something like a data lake or just massive, um, data sets somewhere in Azure, you can now 
connect directly to those and pull in an aggregate view of that data into Power BI for um, displaying into Power BI reports. This is a, a huge step forward in allowing you to do pretty much anything that you need to do analytics-wise in a Power BI report. Um, you don't have to know things like T-SQL or Spark SQL in order to get to these either. Um, and to some extent, it's um, the performance is going to be uh, depending on how your underlying data store serves on them, serves up your data. But largely, it's pretty sweet. You can do all sorts of cool stuff. Um, here are the, some quick updates in Power BI Desktop. So you can now get percent support for conditional formatting by rules. So previously, you had to put in a hard-coded value. Now you can just say when it makes it to 100%, change the color. So that's pretty cool. Um, some serious performance improvements when using relative dates and drop-down slicers. Uh, Power Apps Visual is now certified, which is super cool. You don't have to go download it anymore. It is a, uh, a real one, a real visual. Um, what else is big important here? You can now connect to the Data Lake Gen 2, and there's a Customer Insights connector for Dynamics 365 as well. There's, if you have, if you don't know about anything about customer insights and Dynamics 365, you should. It's a pretty cool thing. Okay, power of the Power Platform. The next one in here is Microsoft Flow. And I've got just a couple updates here for you. Um, if you are frequently coding in Microsoft Flow and you have not used this new cool new cool new feature, you should. It's called the My Clipboard. So if you've got frequently used code snippets, you can store it to your clipboard, which is like a long-term storage of cool code um, and reuse it over and over again, which is super handy. Um, the new There's a new licensing option for Power Apps in Microsoft Flow, which is pay per app or business process. This is huge for um, those of you who don't want to pay for a big license for everybody to use a single app or a couple flows. Um, so if you have any questions there, you should talk to us because this is cool stuff. Um, and then improved integration with Office or, or OneDrive for Business. So you can just implement a flow right inside your OneDrive, which looks something like this. And when you look at your files, you can just click the flow button and kick off a flow. So something like save copy as PDF, request a sign off, send feedback, request or externally. It's pretty cool. All right. Um, next up is the Power Apps portion of the Power Platform. Okay, this is huge. Power Apps portals. Uh, one of the biggest things, the number one request on the Power Apps Ideas website um, is that we want to be able to share apps with people outside our company. Um, up until now, that hasn't been a possibility until we introduce the Power Apps portal. So you can share via a portal, a website, a Power App that somebody can go and consume outside of your company. Um, allows you to interact with your data source or your data stored in the common data service. Super handy. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. It says, welcome to your website or whatever it is. But this is a Power App running in a website for somebody to consume externally. So um, other cool things coming to Power Apps are this new licensing. Instead of paying for a uh, everyone to have like a P1 license or a P2 license, depending on what you're trying to do, you can now pay per app, which would allow you to use all the features and then depending on how many users are using your app, will allow people to consume that without paying for the high cost or higher cost licensing. AI Builder is super cool. You just drag and drop certain uh, controls into your Power App and you can do things like, um, oh, what's the one I was just on the tip of my tongue? Look at a business card and extract all the data right out of it or take pictures of, uh, take, take a picture, upload it right inside the app and then do something with it so like uh, Microsoft, or not Microsoft, Coke, Coca-Cola has a, a uh, app power app that they made that they take a picture of all their contents on a shelf and it will count the number of items and what items are on the shelf and pull it into the power app without having to type in the data. Super handy. Um, there's new Power App Center of Excellence starter kit. So if you're trying to get started with Power Apps and you need um, a trusted set of ways to architect and develop your Power Apps. The Center of Excellence is pretty sweet as far as getting started and knowing where to where to take your Power Apps as you're building them. And then there's this, a very much improved date 
table control with column formulas so you can do calculated columns. Looks something like this. You would drag it in. Um, you can, you used to not be able to do this. It seems kind of silly, but you can now make calculated columns right inside of the formula editor, editor for a specific column in a Power App. So again, Power Apps, if, you, if we didn't give you the overview, Power Apps are um, a quick and really smooth, simple way to get additional functionality built around your um, built around your data sets and Flow will help you automate your processes. Power, Power BI will bring your data to life and help you make better decisions off your data. So that's it for the Power Platform. Hey, I wanted to jump in real quick. This is Eric. There was one thing that uh, Kip and I were both gonna mention and we missed it, so it's my bad. And that is the public announcement that Microsoft made around Skype for Business. Uh, they have now given a date of when the online Skype for Business would be end of life. That is July of 2021. So you roughly have two years to fully get off of Skype for Business online and move to the Teams platform. Um, a couple of other important dates there. They are going to shut down net new deployments of Skype for Business or new tenants to be onboarded to the Skype for Business service this year. Uh, coming relatively soon, like next month. Um, so this year, September-ish, um, you will not be able to onboard Skype for Business in the cloud for net new tenants. Um, On-prem Skype for Business is not a, is still going to be supported for uh, several years. 2025 is the on-prem story, but the cloud is clearly uh, teams, teams, and teams when it comes to Skype for Business. So if you need help migrating off of Skype to Teams, we've got active projects that we're doing that. We've got some good experience with that. And uh, let's talk uh, telephony, VoIP, all that kind of stuff we've got experience with. So just a quick update on the Skype piece and I'm done. Mark, you wanna pick us up? All right, thanks everyone for uh, for joining with us. Um, appreciate it. We've, uh, we, we'll have a survey that'll be emailed out to each of you for you to be able to provide your feedback on. The important thing, I know we covered a lot of content um, on this webinar and uh, a lot of things that you're probably gonna have questions on. We absolutely wanna hear those questions and absolutely wanna get an answer for you. So please let us know what those are. If we wanna really dive in deeper into some of these services, some new things that we've covered into, Let's set up a time for you to sit down with Eric, uh, and the Eric's, Preston, Kip, George, um, and members of their team to kind of go through everything that that uh, you really want to explore on those some of those new things that you may have heard of today. Um, lastly, you know, as a Microsoft partner, um, obviously we're we're here to, to help support Microsoft technologies, but we are definitely not a Microsoft apologist, and so we'll let you know where things or gaps are. I'm sure one of the questions a lot of you have is why are we not using Teams and we're using Webinar for this event? Realistically, the the, the challenges are uh, we didn't use Teams um, because we found that there were some holes with people who were guests who were not going to be able to use the Teams app to be able to join. So please know that that even with that, as we admit that um, and, and share that out with you, and that's something that Microsoft is stabilizing and improving for us, that when you talk with us, when you reach out with those answers, you're gonna get the honest answer, not just the Microsoft rose-colored glasses answer to everything. So with that, um, we're gonna go ahead and, and end our webinar. We'll give you guys back seven minutes of your day that you, you had planned to, to spend with us, and we look forward to, to hearing from you and talking further.